Still sailing on the open waters of the Shining Sea, we made our stop at the port of Urbeth on the independent island nation of Tharsalt, and more specifically into Shaltown, where we had offloaded the big square bundles of furs on board, and replacing the cargo with hundreds of animal crates and loads of fresh vegetables with bales of hay. We then set sail with the tide heading directly for the city of Saffron, also known as Urumpar, now in southwestern proper southwestern Faerun at least, or the outskirts of it at the border of the land of Lapalia. But the city of Saffron is an independent city-state anyway, one of the so-called cities of the sea breeze. We made port in the evening at the eastern tip of the Shining Sea and at the head of Orumpa Bay and at the northern foot of the Shayam Peninsula with the shadow of the Wormbones Mountains bringing an early reprieve from the southern heat. Ormpar has a long stone jetty that bustles with activity, mostly well-guarded cargoes of spices and travellers going any one of five different directions from there. We were met by a very unusual seeming trio of mages wrapped in some flamboyant and fashionable wizard robes who filled all of their cages on board the ship with El Mirage. When I saw the size of them, I worried we'd not brought enough food for them all. These creatures were my ticket into the nation of Halrua, as I had been hired to travel with them, guarding them and a few of the crew as they made the overland trek into the land of mages. An Al Mirage is a large timid hare with a one foot long spiral horn emerging from its forehead. They have a ruff of longer fur like a mane around the sides and back of the head and generally thick body fur of a distinctly yellow colour. They have no mystical powers, they're just animals, but they are much more common further south in Faerun and very common in far off lands of Saqqara and Karatur. And of course, they are found throughout the Feywild. While originally, and still found commonly within the Feywild, they came to the planet Toril and established wild breeding populations in the lands of Zakara, and they travelled with traders and genies from there along the southern coast of Faerun and made their way to, into Karatur via sea trade mostly. Typically those who take the effort or opportunity to run trade between the Prime Material Plane and the Feywild can benefit from the Al Mirage there being of a more vibrant colour, larger size and generally excellent health. An Al Mirage buck can reach twice the size of a buck from Faerun and have a horn that is fully two feet long. Of course, the Almirage of that size either live in parts of the Feywild that are quite seriously dangerous or they have been raised or influenced by the presence of an intelligent Feywild resident who may react quite aggressively to having their pets or livestock stolen. There are also specific efforts in the Feywild to breed special riding Almiraj for the use of Fey folk who either are or can transform into a tiny size. Almiraj naturally tend to take off in mad dashes of speed, so training them as riding mounts is challenging. Stopping them from diving into holes or into underbrush and knocking off, probably injuring their rider is also a job for animal handlers with a lot of patience, empathy and time, so riding Elmiraj are rarely young animals. The most southern population of them in the wild on Tyrol is located in the land of Chult. They seem to thrive in quite tropical and hostile jungles. Skilled at evading predators, these creatures have flourished throughout the tropical peninsula. They live in earthen burrows called warrens with many branching chambers that form individual females' nests. They're not formidable creatures and can be captured and domesticated. In the wild, a female nests in a depression on the surface of the ground rather than in a burrow, and the young are active as soon as they are born. Litters may consist of three or four young, and a female can bear three litters a year, with an average almirage living for up to 12 years. The breeding season last from January to August. An Almiraj has an armor class of 13, 1d6 hit points, they're fast, moving at 50 feet per round, they can dash 100 feet, and hide with a plus 5 to stealth checks. They can freeze and wait for any sign of pursuit with a plus 4 advantage on their perception checks involving their hearing and sight. Also, they have 30 foot dark vision. They don't normally attack predators with their horn, but when goaded, driven into a corner or protecting the young, they will. The male, or buck Elmiraj, has a one foot long, usually golden brown and spiral curled horn, similar to a unicorn horn. The female, or doe Elmiraj, has a slightly more slender horn that grows up to one foot and is usually cream or pearl coloured, growing from the peak of its skull, so above the eyes, not between them. This makes them good at charging into things with that horn, but not great for seeing where they're going when they're making a charge, otherwise they run with their eyes up, not their head lowered. You don't accidentally get skewered by a running Elmraj, even a panic-fueled herd of Elmraj racing around madly. 
The does will sometimes charge to protect their nest and their litter of kits. The bucks are more aggressive and charge to protect their does and the warren in general. But otherwise, their role is to run into the warren last and turn back with their horn facing back outward to ward off any nimble predator small enough to chase after them down the hole. They are all born fairly well developed, they already have hair, their eyes are open and they can move around on their own, which makes them more similar to hares than rabbits. They're not born with uh, fully grown horns of course, it's not made of bone, it can regrow if broken. It's not suitable for making a drinking horn but makes for a decorative handle. And in the swamps of the Zakaran coast, it's common to see them traded as fishing spear tips. You can get a good price for them, particularly if they've carved with local tribal patterns and have some history behind who they were owned by. The spear tip of a famous leader or shaman can fetch a good price at a museum. Ironically, the further away from Zakara you are, the better price for the increasingly exotic icon becomes. That's just generally true for all artifacts though. If you're lucky enough to capture an Almirage when they're young, they are surprisingly open to domestication and training and can become a decent pet or adventuring companion. Almirage are more active at night in the wild and when facing a threat an adult thumps its front feet. The hind feet are used to warn others of a predator, they can tell the difference. It squeals when hurt or scared and a female makes guttural calls to attract her young. Most of their communication among themselves or with some spellcaster who has formed a magical bond with one consists of reading the position of the head, the tail, the ears and the feet with occasional vocal sounds or foot thumps. In 2nd edition D&D, the Almiraj could suddenly teleport short distances like some sort of a blink bunny. They became immune to all poisons and they lost their timid nature, rather they would leap to defend themselves from dangerous humanoids. Most of this was dropped in 3rd edition, the animals do gain a burrowing speed and are liable to just dig their way out of danger. Now in 5th edition they are back to being cute, fairly large bunnies that make for good pets, erratic riding mounts and pretty good eating with one Elmiraj of Fey origin rendering up the same sort of meat load as a Thanksgiving turkey, which is perfect for a famished hardworking adventuring group. A similar species, but much more common in the Shah grasslands and the endless wastes of the Tuigan hordelands, the jackalope is a creature with most of the qualities of an ordinary hare, a similar breeding rate to the Elmiraj and a fairly huge population spread out across vast grasslands, rolling hills and forest edges. The jackalopes handle arid environments a lot better than the Elmiraj does. They can also eat more thorny, dry and nutrient poor plants than the Elmiraj and still thrive. Prices vary hugely for the exotic horned rabbits. The most impressive prices are the prized purebred Almiraj bred and raised to simply be beautiful and affectionate pets. They are shown in tournaments in the cities of Halrua, along with even more exotic creatures. The cheapest would be the street food vendors in the Feywild cities, hawking spit roasted Almiraj drumsticks with sticky fruit chutney glaze, which are highly delicious and usually quite cheap. A good snack for an adventurer on the move and a safe bet as street vendors don't usually drug their food, just some enchantments to keep it hot and fresh. Thank you for that lore request, remember if you have any special requests for a topic I have not covered yet, let me know in the comments section down below, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon. So how can you use the Almirage in a tactical dynamic encounter? Let's say we make it to Halrua and we've just happened to be raiding the Demiplane family vault of a Halrua gnomish wizard. We find a 40 foot circular room made of closely fitted natural stone of a purple hue with portraits lining the walls. In the centre of the room is a wheel like that of a sailing ship with a lever at the right hand side of it. There are six short pillars of purple stone with squares of metal on top of them, bordering a square hole in the centre of each stone pillar. Directly opposite from the entrance across the far side of the huge room, a pair of large cogwheel doors forming an airlock chamber protecting and sealing the treasure vault. Spinning this 
steering wheel clockwise will raise up the metal cages and reveal their metal bars are all independently mobile, like flying blades more than prison bars. Inside each cage, an Al Miraj rises up from inside the pillar and sits in the cage. Then, from the roof, two orbs, one blue and the other green, flash enchantments at the Al Miraj's horns. The first turns the horns into magically guided weapons. The second enlarges the creatures to twice their normal size. The cages all smoothly break apart and the blades spin to collect protectively around the magic orbs, raising the armor class of each orb from 11 to 15. As long as the magical enraged Almiraj are alive and the two orbs are intact, the magic continues. If the orbs are broken by having their 40 hit points reduced to zero or the, all the Almiraj are killed, the orb and cage blade magic explodes, sending a hail of cage blades randomly all over the room. DC 15 dexterity save is required if, or a victim takes 1d6 damage. If they roll a 6, they roll an additional 1d6 and so on. Hmm. What treasures would a gnomish hell ruin wizard keep in such a vault? Why, a prized Elmrod buck? Fresh from a prize-winning breeder in a more cosmopolitan fey realm, plus spell books, very old wine, rare spell components, precious stones, unusual and rare, very well-preserved specimens, very nice leather furniture, tasteful marble statues, and a fine collection of various exotic pipe weeds. Oh yeah, the lever next to the steering wheel. Um, you can have it so that if you're spinning around the steering wheel clockwise, it will raise up those cages at the same time that those uh, cog wheel um, vault doors are winding open so what the one is connected to the other so you're winding this wheel and all of the cages are raising up and the doors are opening and then when you reach halfway it makes a clicking sound now if you engage the lever on the side you can keep going just clockwise and the cages will all lower down again and the Elmrage will go away <laughs> and the vault doors open for you. If you don't engage the lever, um, then you can spin the, the steering wheel either way, right or left. And if you go counterclockwise at that point, um, they will carry on. Uh, it will still lower the cages, but the Elmirage will still be there. And then they will be released, enlarged, enraged with magical horns and attack you. There may be uh, secret compartments in one of the old Raj pillars, or each of the different pillars could be accessed by coded locks, and inside you might find a collection of wands, potions, wondrous items, rare books, belts, gloves, boots, rings, daggers, and so on. Perhaps even a collection of old treasure maps. Have a good week, everybody.